Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the RCBC Rowan College of Burlington County Global Studies Lecture Series, a continuation of a series of conversations that started in fall 2020 and continue today in global health, environment, and security and key international issues affecting those areas. This is partially sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education's Undergraduate International Studies and Foreign Language Grant Program, a multi-year grant that uh, RCBC has with our partner institution, Rowan University, as well. Uh, to build global and international studies uh, programs at both institutions and also to offer courses in high demand languages uh, such as Arabic. To try to bring data and long term perspective uh, to the topic of immigration and immigration policy, um, which we have found to be centered around anecdotes 
and fears rather than data and facts. Much of our book is comparing the immigrants that you see here um, on the front cover, immigrants who were arriving from Europe to the United States around 100 years ago to immigrants from around the world today. Um, at the time, the U.S. had a nearly open border to immigration from Europe. And so these immigrants from the past uh, did not require a visa or a passport for entry. They didn't need to prove that they were um, holding a job already or had family members already in the U.S. And we have a nostalgic view about these immigrants that they assimilated quickly and that they moved up the economic ladder, whereas today immigrants are slower to move up and are less willing to assimilate. Um, and so our goal is to subject this kind of historical comparison to scrutiny using big data. In fact, our title, Streets of Gold, came from this myth that immigrants from the past were able to move to the U.S. and very quickly move up the ladder. But the truth um, is actually potentially much more complex. Uh, so if you have ever visited the Ellis Island Museum, you may have seen painted there on the wall this quotation that's attributed to an unnamed Italian immigrant who said, I came to America because I heard that the streets were paved with gold. But when I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. So our question about the past is, was it really as rosy as we might think when we look back with nostalgia? What would our understanding of American immigration history looked like if we were able to build data from millions of immigrant families, much like this unnamed Italian immigrant here, and instead of looking only to the great success stories that might make it to the front page of the newspaper, instead tell the story of the more typical or average immigrant. And likewise today, if instead of looking for the most notorious cases, the criminals who might make it to the newspaper, um, at, who um, politicians are quick to point out were born abroad, um, what if instead we were able to build data for millions of immigrant families today? So how do we put this data together? I'm going to start by just explaining what we do for the past um, because it is more interesting to think about how do you go back 100 years in time and reconstruct immigrant families from the historical record. And then when I get to it, I'll point out our data sources for the modern period. For the past, we are using data from the U.S. Census. And um, you may, some of you, have gone to genealogy websites like Ancestry.com to search up your own great-grandparents. So you can really think of us as starting out like curious grandchildren going to Ancestry.com. And in fact, that's exactly what we did. We started to look up by hand a couple hundred families. And then we got greedy and we thought, what if we look up a thousand or 10,000? And we started generating automated searches on the Ancestry website. So much so that the Ancestry corporate office noticed that the traffic on their website was higher than they expected. And then they ended up tracing that heightened traffic back to just three accounts, um, one of them belonging to me, one belonging to Ron, and one belo belonging to our co-author, Katherine Erickson. Ron then received a cease and desist call from the Ancestry lawyers saying that we were no longer allowed to scrape data off of their website. When they realized that we were academics, they decided that they could join research partnership with us. We weren't actually trying to take the data and sell it. 
Um, and so we now have access to all of the underlying census data sets. What we've been adding here is a set of algorithms that allow us to follow people over time. In the census, we don't have access to social security numbers or any kind of unique identifier. So we follow people by using information like their first and last name and their age and their state or country of birth. What I'm showing you on this screen now is a PDF of a census manuscript, though when we go to use the data, we're using the digitized format. And I'm not showing you this family at random. This is, in fact, my great-grandfather here, Hyman Platt, who was living in Chicago in 1920. He was 51 years old. He was living with his wife, Annie, who was 40, and then their eight children. My grandfather here was Matthew, the seventh of their eight children, who was seven years old at the time of the 1920 census. If you scroll over on the page, you will see the occupations of my family members who are working. Obviously, the seven-year-old still in school, but those who are in the workforce. And what you learn from my family is that my great-grandfather, the immigrant himself, never moved up the economic ladder. He remained in low-paying manual jobs throughout his life, but his children did move ahead moving into white collar positions that required a high school education. And eventually my grandfather and his younger brother um, going to City College in Chicago and becoming a doctor and a lawyer. So what you see for my family is going to reflect the larger pattern that we see in the data, both in the past and today. A very common immigrant experience that the first generation moves up slowly and never completely catches up with U.S. born workers, but the second generation, the children of immigrants are the ones who rise. So in the book, we reassess four major myths about immigration using this big data. First of all, we ask, is it really true that we're experiencing an unprecedented flood of immigration today? And the answer to this is actually quite easy to show that the answer is no. We've had periods in U.S. history before with just as many immigrants as a share of the population that we have today. And then we ask, is it true that the Ellis Island generation 100 years ago rose quickly from rags to riches, whereas immigrants today are not as successful? And the answer again is no. The first generation never moved up very quickly. Another myth is about the children of immigrants, that somehow the children of immigrants were able to succeed in the past, but are stuck in a permanent underclass today. Again, this myth is not correct. The children of immigrants are just as successful now as they were 100 years ago in moving up the ladder. Um, and finally, we look at some cultural outcomes and we reject the idea that immigrants are not trying to become American uh, with their cultural practices today. Um, in fact, cultural assimilation is happening at the same pace now as it did in the past. So I'm not gonna have time to go over each one of these myths with you today, um, but I'm gonna show you something about myth one so that we all kind of get on the same page about how many immigrants are coming into the US today and then I will show you something about the children. So um, this is a simple graph, does not require any of the cool big data that I just described for you. Just going back to the census over 150 years and asking what share of the population was born abroad. What's going on these days is that the share of the population born abroad is higher now than it's been in around 50 years. And that makes people nervous. So I was a kid down here in the 70s um, and my parents were kids here in the 50s. And so we had an, an America that looked different um, in terms of the share foreign born. And so these days, 14% of the country's foreign born and that seems worrying to some voters. But in no way is this unique in US history. If you go back to the Ellis Island era, we had a 50 year stretch 
uh, where the share of the U.S. population born abroad was also at 14 percent and was true for 50 years. In between these two high points, you see what we call this immigration valley. Um, and this was um, a result of immigration policy changes. So in the 1920s, uh, the border was substantially closed to uh, migration from Europe. There was a set of country-specific quotas uh, that were put in place that lower the number of entry slots, particularly for the Southern and Eastern European countries um, that were perceived to be new immigrant arrivals, the Italians, the Russians, the Poles, and so on. Um, and in 1965, the border reopens again, although in a constrained fashion. So there's more demand for entry into the U.S. now uh, than there are visa slots available. Now, there's one major similarity between the past and present, which is the share of the population foreign born, 14 to 15% in the past, 14 to 15% today. But there's also a few major differences that would lead us to believe that immigrants may have a very different experience now than they did in the past. Um, I think the biggest one is really the country of origin uh, composition. So this is a very similar graph to what I showed you before, but now we're breaking down the share foreign born into three major regions of the world uh, for their region of origin. The yellow regions are European countries, the red regions are the Americas, and the blue is Asia. So you can see that historically, immigrants, 90% of them came from Europe, and the remainder came from Canada. So the immigrant origins in the past were similar to the origins of the U.S. born. Today, we see a much more diverse set of sending countries with the largest country as Mexico here in the Americas, um, a large uh, inflow now from Asia, and then a much smaller share from Europe. So just simply due to country of origin differences, you might think, well, immigrants are going to have a harder time now than in the past. Maybe they face more discrimination. Um, maybe they come from countries that are poorer and they've had less opportunity to have education in their home country. Yet what we're finding when we compare the immigrants of today to the immigrants of the past is really a commonality rather than a difference. So I'm going to show you this by looking at the children of immigrants. What happens to the children of immigrants who grow up um, in poverty? Um, do they rise out of poverty today? And did they rise out of poverty in the past? So I'm going to focus on a whole set of kids that are being raised in households at the 25th percentile of the income distribution. So think about this as two working parents working full time at a minimum wage job. What happens to the kids in households like this? And for the past, we can look at this with our linked census data. And I've already described how we link people from one census to another. That also allows us to link children who we see at home with their parents to their own adult selves. In the modern data, we're using the IRS tax records. Um, if you file taxes and you have a child living at home, you report that child as a tax dependent and you write down that child's social security number. That then allows researchers to follow the, that child when they become an adult and enter the labor market. Of course, this data is highly, highly secret and secure, and so we do not have access to the individual tax records. We get this data from Opportunity Insights, um, and they um, have a research partnership with the IRS. So let's take a look at the modern picture first. Um, what we're looking at here is how high in the income rank do children raised at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution, how high do they do, do the children reach? If you look at the kind of dark magenta dot on the left-hand lower side of the picture, those are the children of white U.S. born parents who are raised at the 25th percentile, and they're reaching like the 46th percentile. So kids are able to move up on average beyond where their parents were if they're being raised in a working poor household. 
but take a look at the peach dots, which reflect children of immigrants from 45 sending countries who were also raised at the 25th percentile of the income distribution in the United States. And for 42 of these countries, the children of uh, households with similar resources during childhood are reaching a higher point in the income distribution when they themselves get to adulthood. So you have some really dramatic cases of children being raised at the 25th percentile and reaching the 60th and above, particularly um, for uh, families whose parents were born in Asia, Hong Kong, China, India, Taiwan, Pakistan, Vietnam. Then you have a whole set of countries in the middle of this image um, where um, the children are reaching the 50th to 55th percentile, including a set of countries that are pointed to by politicians to say they're contributing to a crisis at the southern border. So these are uh, countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and yet children from households uh, of these parents raised at the 25th percentile are reaching up above the median by the time they get to adulthood, and they're more socially mobile uh, than the children of white U.S. born parents. An interesting counterpoint are the children whose parents are born in the Caribbean, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, and Jamaica, three majority or plurality black countries. So you may think that this is a race story. However, keep in mind that we're looking only at sons. I've been saying children, but this is actually a, a data plot for sons only. And if I were to look at daughters instead, in fact, the daughters of these Caribbean families are doing very well and they're up here in the middle of the pack. So it's much more complicated than race alone, but it's some sort of interaction between race and gender. Finally, let's compare to the historical period. And this is what really blew us away as researchers. We were expecting to find more upward mobility in my grandfather's generation, a period where college was free or, you know, cost only a couple hundred dollars a year, um, a period where children may have benefited from something like the GI Bill. Um, and yet what we're finding is a pattern that looks very similar to the past. So if we look at boys who were living at home in 1910, for example, we see that children raised at the 25th percentile of the income distribution whose parents are white U.S. born, they're moving up, but they're not moving up nearly as quickly as the children of immigrant parents, especially country, from countries like Italy, Ireland, and Portugal, and Russia, the newer sending countries or the poorer sending countries that politicians at the time said would never be able to assimilate into the U.S. economy. How is it that children of immigrant parents are able to do so well? Well, in the historical data, we have a lot of information about these countries. In the modern data here, we really don't yet because this comes from the IRS Research Partnership. So essentially, we only get this very aggregated information for privacy purposes. But in the historical data, I can tell you how it is that these children are able to do so well historically. It's not education historically. In fact, the children of um, families from Italy, Ireland, Portugal, they had less education than the children of white U.S. born parents raised at the same point of the income distribution. Yet they're still earning a bit more. And the reason why is geography. Immigrant parents were more likely to move to areas that offered upward mobility for everyone who lived there. And the most important factor historically for providing upward mobility was the, the access to manufacturing jobs. Uh, so if you think about um, the bridge in Trenton, Trenton makes the world takes. At the time, that would have been a very good place to move um, because there would have been um, a cluster of manufacturing opportunities here in New Jersey. And those are the types of places that immigrant families moved. They were much less likely to move to the U.S. South, for example, um, which was a highly agricultural region, primarily cotton growing, sharecrop farming, and that was not a good place for upward mobility for kids. So what I'm showing you on this graph is to say here on the left-hand side is the raw difference in income rank points between children of immigrants and children of U.S. born raised at the 25th percentile. 
the children of immigrants achieve six additional rank points. So they're reaching, instead of the 46th percentile, they would be reaching the 52nd percentile. Now, let's try to explain that raw gap. And all the way over on the right-hand side, you can see children who are being raised in the same county. Like all the kids in Mercer County alone, in fact, there was no social mobility gap at all between children of immigrants and children of U.S. born. So how can there be a six point raw gap with no gap within the county? What that teaches us is that the gap on the nationwide level is coming from where immigrants are located. They're not located in the low mobility places and they're much more highly represented in the high mobility places. So geography was the key in the past. My guess, is that education is gonna be much more important in explaining the modern picture, but we're still waiting on possibly getting some uh, data there from the IRS. Finally, I have mentioned that we do look in the book at cultural outcomes. There's a number of outcomes that we look at. Who do immigrants marry? Where do they live? Do they speak English? But one measure we really like that I just wanted to talk, touch on briefly on this slide um, is the shift in names that immigrant parents choose for their own children as they spend more time in the country. And the best way of representing this, I think, is our Vice President Kamala Harris, um, compared to her sister, Maya Harris. Um, Kamala was born three years earlier than Maya to their two immigrant parents, one from Jamaica and one from India. Um, and Kamala is a very Hindi name is a name that's much more likely to be found among someone born in India than someone born in the US. Whereas Maya is a very international name and is relatively equally weighted between people born abroad and people born in the US. So it's more ethnically ambiguous. And that is what we find in a nutshell is that immigrant parents, as they spend time in the country, select names for their kids that are more ambiguous, that um, uh, could be a foreign name, but could be a US born name as well. Um, and what's interesting is that they're doing so at the same rate today as they used to do this in the past. So this is a really cool and interesting measure of cultural assimilation that we can compare for past and present. Um, in the past, we're using um, our census records. As you saw for my grandfather, he was in his household with eight, um, well, he was one of eight, so with his seven siblings. Um, those siblings are born in different years, so we can see how many years had their parents lived in the US at the time they're born and what name do they select? In the modern data, we're using the California birth certificate records where we can follow mothers who have multiple children in the state of California. And we use the data to tell us about the foreignness of each name. We count up all of the Leahs who were born in the US and the Leahs who were born abroad. And we look at the relative probability that the name is assigned to a foreigner versus uh, to an American. Um, for Leah, it might be something like one, um, very equally balanced, one to one, but for Kamala, it might be something more like 10 to one, where you're 10 times more likely to find that name um, in a population that was born abroad. And we find that as immigrant moms spend more time in the country, um, then they shift away from these foreign sounding names at a very similar pace now um, as in the past. So the way that we sum up our findings is that the American dream seems to be just as real now as it was in the past, whether we're looking at upward economic mobility or whether we're looking at the cultural process of becoming American, we see much more commonality between the past and present um, than we originally thought we would find. Which leads us to wonder why has it been so hard recently to make progress on immigration reform if the news is so optimistic? And the short answer, as you will not be surprised, is polarization across political parties. And I'm going to show you on the next slide um, what this polarization looks like for um, immigration topics over 150 years and how unique our challenges are today for addressing immigration reform through our political system. But another way of, of looking at what I'm about to show you is that the optimistic news about immigration is coming through to the public. 
First of all, on public opinion polls, 75% of Americans say that immigration is good for the country. And as you'll see um, on the next slide, the average speech in the congressional record about immigration topics is positive today in a way that was not at all the, the case in the past. So I'm eventually going to show you on this slide the full century, but I'm starting with the period of Ellis Island immigration. And I am showing you here um, the difference between speeches that are pro-immigration, subtracting the, the, the share of speeches that are anti-immigration. And so the numbers here are hovering at around minus 50, suggesting that the majority of speeches in the past were anti-immigration. This was true for both Democrats in blue and for Republicans in red. Um, and very unrelenting over time. So there was no period in the past where the average speech about immigration was positive. And we often would hear statements like this one here. Um, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge was one of the architects of border closure in the past, saying things like immigrants are from races most alien to the body of the American people. And at the time I thought, well, that he must be an outlier of some kind. But in fact, if you measure Senator Lodge's speeches about immigration and put them right next to the averages, he actually looks somewhat run of the mill. This is what politicians were saying about immigration essentially for um, 75 years. And then between the ending of World War II and 1965, when the border reopened to immigration, we see a shift in one generation from on average negative to on average positive speeches. And finally, if we go forward to today, we see that the average, which is the gray line, is still positive, but we see a bifurcation by political party. Um, and the bifurcation is wider now than it has ever been. Underlying these averages are a whole bunch of individual dots for speeches from individual Congress people. Um, and um, I didn't, of course, explain too much about the methodology of how we classify these speeches as pro or anti-immigration. I'm happy to talk about that in questions. Um, but what you see in the very recent era, um, the past five years or so, is that there is not a single Democratic senator or House member um, who has, on average, negative things to say about immigration. And there's hardly a single Republican House member or senator who has positive things to say about immigration. So not only on average is there polarization, but there doesn't really seem to be anyone to talk to in the middle. So we started to think about what's driving this partisan gap, and we classify these speeches by topic, and we find that Republicans, not surprisingly, are talking about crime and they're talking about legality. Those are two separate issues. One is, are immigrants here committing crimes like murder and robbery and assault? And the other one is, maybe the immigrant is not engaging in a criminal act, but they're entering into the U.S. in, in a fashion that's illegal. Those are the two major topics in Republican speeches, whereas Democratic speeches are primarily about family and fi family reunification, as well as about refugees and persecution and reaching out for humanitarian um, purposes to immigrants. So how do we bridge this gap when the topics are entirely disjoint? That led us to our most recent work, and I will end with just a few new facts from our recent work, and then we'll break for questions. Um, so we thought to ourselves, I guess we're in the wrong discipline. We've been talking so much about um, upward mobility, about labor market uh, competition between immigrants and US workers, but we should really be thinking about crime and incarceration and seeing what we can learn that might sway uh, voters in the middle, given how much Republicans have been talking about immigration and crime. So we've put together the first long run time series on incarceration, comparing immigrants to the US born. We do this by using census data. Um, if you are at, living at home in a household with your roommates or with your parents, um, or eventually if you're married with your kids, um, then you're going to be classified in the census in your household. But if you're living in a jail or prison, you will be classified there as living in a correctional facility. Um, and so that's the data that we're using, just counting uh, immigrants and U.S.-born who are living in correctional facilities. 
Um, and this is what the data looks like. So the tagline here is that there's never been an era in U.S. history when immigrants were more likely than the U.S. born to be incarcerated. Never. And so this was really quite striking to me because of all the messages I hear connecting immigration and crime. So you can see that incarceration has dramatically increased uh, from 1880 to um, 2010 or so um, as a a share immigration, the I'm um, sorry, the incarceration rate as um, per hundred thousand members of the population um, has increased sixfold, and that's what we call mass incarceration. But then look at the orange versus the blue line: first generation immigrants versus the U.S. born, and we see that the first generation immigrants have always had lower incarceration rates than the, the U.S. born and that the rise in mass incarceration was primarily coming from the U.S. born and less so from immigrants. So, of course, we want to start breaking this down into different subgroups, and I'm going to just slide through that. What about Europeans, starting with the Northern and Western Europeans, like the British, the Germans, and so on? Okay, same pattern. What about the Southern and Eastern Europeans that were so much the concern of someone like Senator Henry Cabot Lodge trying to close the border to these new arrivals? Same pattern for them as well, including for the Italians that Senator Lodge said were um, members of mafias and gangs. What about the Chinese? Well, there was a couple of years where their rates of incarceration may be a bit higher than the U.S. born. Since 1960, when the border reopens, they have dramatically lower incarceration than even the European immigrant groups. What about Mexicans and Central Americans who have been a topic of conversation by candidate Trump and then thereafter in the Republican Party? Historically, they, ha they did face higher rates of incarceration. Um, perhaps uh, being targeted by law enforcement or targeted by the judicial system. But since 1960, Mexicans and Central Americans as a group have lower incarceration rates than the U.S. born as well. The one place where this is not true is if we compare Mexicans and Central Americans to white U.S. born only. And there we see that since the year 2000, Mexicans and Central Americans have had higher incarceration. However, Incarceration in the census can include jail and prison. It can also include immigrant detention facilities. So if we strip out the immigrant detention facilities as best as possible in our data, we find that this gap disappears. And the gap reverses entirely if we adjust only for education. If we're comparing high school dropouts to high school dropouts or college graduates to college graduates, then Mexicans and Central Americans have much lower incarceration rates than even the white U.S. born. So we conclude from this that indeed the American dream is just as real now as it was 100 years ago, but upward mobility has always taken time. It's not going to be a, um, the province of the first generation. It will take time to the second generation, the children of immigrants, to experience this upward mobility. What's distinctive about our period in U.S. history is that it's the first period in, of time in which we've had a large number of pro-immigration politicians. If you go back to 1900, that was not the case for either political party, but now we have a political party that on, on average has very positive things to say about immigration. However, they're facing a polarized electorate and um, a partisan gap um, with their um, opposition party. So what can we do then to try to bring these two political groups closer together and possibly generate enough consensus for immigration reform? Our thinking is at least our comparative advantage as quantitative social scientists is that maybe data and evidence will sway the middle, the moderates who are between the parties. Um, and one concern that's clearly present for um, the moderates um, is fear that immigration will accelerate crime. Um, when we looked into this pattern, we find that this does not fit the facts. And as much as it's possible to sway uh, voters with data and evidence, we hope that our work can contribute to that public debate.